Uh, what's up, guys? We're talking about anything you want, vaccines. I'm getting so many emails, right, um, that I figure let's just do a conversation because the emails are very similar. Um, each one kind of begins with, okay, here's my life story, 20 pages of stuff, which it, it's interesting because I think people feel either close or connected or open with me because they see me so much in a, in a very natural, authentic way. Like, this is just what I'm doing. It's live. We're just talking, right? So they really feel like, you know, able to send me these big, long things, which I think is wonderful. The problem is I can't read it all because it's too much. But what I am noticing is they're, they're really similar stories. You know, a lot of people have questions why I have autoimmune disease. I'm pregnant. I don't trust the government. I don't trust how we've been manipulated. I'm say conservative and I don't, I feel like this has been so politicized that I'm just not comfortable doing this. I, I've been naturally infected. You know, all these actually very reasonable viewpoints on this because yeah, you should mistrust the government. <laughs> you, they, what, what, when have they really specifically told you the truth, of, you know, the full truth about anything, right? Humans have really decent BS meters in the age of the internet. Um, although it's interesting, it, it fails sometimes when clear, con artists are out there and they're able to capitalize on emotional resonance, right? Like people like Mercola, who's made millions of dollars. Like this guy is butt booty rich, Dr. Mercola, selling like basically anti-vaccine stuff. Sherry Tenpenny, same thing. And you know, like you can be skeptical about vaccines, but like if you're making millions of dollars selling alternatives to vaccines, whether it's tanning beds like Mercola or whatever, you know, owed to essential oil he's selling, you know, and there's nothing wrong with essential oils, but I don't know. Anyways, so one other thing I want to tell you guys. So Cynthia Cruz Noble, one of my supporters on our supporter tribe sent me, got it in the mail today, this 3D printed Doc Vader, and he holds a lightsaber looking high-end cross pen. And she sent me this. So I want to thank Cynthia for this dope. Look at this. The circle is now complete. When I left you, I had a crappy little bick. Now I am the master of clicky pens. Uh, all right, let's look at some comments here and uh, get some questions going on. You, you know, and m maybe what I should do to start with is, you know, since we're just kind of free ball on this live, um, let, me, let me hit you with some of the top things that I'm getting on email, right? So, and by the way, if you do email me through my website, um, there's a form there, uh, please keep it brief. Because I've seen I've seen all the stories. Just give me like a couple bullets, and if it's about vaccines, I'll probably answer it. Right? Um, if it's something crazy, other medical advice, things like that, I can't do that. Uh, and there's just too many messages. So okay, one of the most common things is okay. I'm pregnant. I'm in X trimester. Um, I'm young. I'm not high risk. Should I get vaccinated? I'm very nervous about it. I don't want to. Anything I do, if I end up with a miscarriage or something like that, I'm going to blame the vaccine. I'm going to feel terrible. I'm really, really what they're saying is I'm going to blame myself, right, for making this decision. And my answer to this is based on the data we have so far, which is that we don't see an increased risk in pregnancy with vaccination in terms of miscarriage, in terms of poor fetal outcomes, in terms of poor maternal outcomes. We just haven't seen it. And lots of pregnant women have gotten this vaccination at this point. And it's gotten to the point where, you know, the American College of Obstet Obstet Obstetrics and Gynecology, the M Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, the CDC and others have basically said, hey, you should offer this to pregnant women, right? They're comfortable with this. This is what they do, right? And, um, I know there's a lot of mistrust of big organizations. I know there's mistrust of CDC. I know there's mistrust of Fauci. I know there's mistrust of government. Yeah, all that's fair, absolutely. There are, that you, you, have, you should have reason to be skeptical, but when it comes to this, if you actually look at the data and you look at like what's happening in the actual world, pregnant women are at higher risk of complications of COVID. So we see it in the hospital, right? Now, again, in an absolute sense, it's not a huge risk. So what I often tell people is, listen, whatever decision you make, like it's your decision. It's the right decision for you based on what you've heard, your values, and how you're interpreting your own risk and the risk of your child and all that. All I can tell you is, okay, here's what I understand of the data. Here's what I would do for my loved one. And with pregnant women, I tell them, if you were my wife or my sister or whatever it is, someone I was close to who was pregnant, I would be really, really, really hoping that you would get vaccinated. And I don't care what it is, just get it done. Because 
again, if you can lower the risk of severe disease from COVID. Now, I would also say this, this is assuming that you haven't had already been infected with COVID, because if you have, then you have considerable immunity from that. And we've talked about this again and again and again. So at that point, no decision you make is wrong. And you may say, oh, I don't wanna do it, or maybe I just wanna get one dose, right? Because that's gonna act like my booster shot with to the natural infection and I'll be superstar immune. And talk to your gynecologist, your obstetrician, talk to your doctor, talk to your family, talk to whoever matters to you in terms of making this decision. All I can say is if you were my loved one, I would really hope you either had, you had some kind of immunity, right? Whether it was you were infected before, I'm not saying go out and get infected, God, no, I'm saying, You've either had infection or you're getting vaccinated or have gotten vaccinated. So that, that's how I think about pregnancy. And, and the truth is the same goes with nursing mothers. There's no reason to believe that vaccinating nursing, nursing mothers would harm a child. And in fact, if anything, they produce antibodies that pass in breast milk. And those antibodies are a good thing for a young child if you're concerned about infection with coronavirus, right? And with Delta being so infectious, it really does tear through a population quickly. And so pretty much everybody at some point is gonna be exposed or infected. So would you rather you know, run the risk of getting infected and having wild type COVID and maybe doing just fine, or maybe not, or getting a vaccine that really, guys, like I'm gonna say this again, yeah, there's risk of myocarditis. It's small, but it's real, especially in younger men, but it can happen. Um, maybe there's, a, you know, in Israeli data, maybe there's some increased rate of appendicitis. Um, uh, and weirdly, interestingly, shingles seems to, there, there, there was some Israeli data set. Now, again, that needs follow-up and it needs full thing, but like, so let's see, shingles, uh, myocarditis, which is usually quite reversible. This is a bummer if you get it, right? But it's quite reversible, it's rare appendicitis, which can be managed, and even that's not really clear, but there was an increase in the Israeli data set, um, versus what we know about coronavirus, which is, oh my gosh, it's like a 19 times increased risk of myocarditis, blood clots, neurologic damage, ICU stay, post-ICU damage, if you saw our interview with Dr. Wes Ely about that. Um, it's really, to me, it's not a contest between which is safer to get right? Now, and I understand why you're reluctant, I do. Um, I really do. Uh, we've talked about it many times. And the truth is, it doesn't help when like people are trying to ostracize you. Now, it is interesting because there's different cultural motifs. If you look, and I just uh, was at a, was a, got some Stanford data, they had compiled everything for a grand rounds and I went through the slides. So the latest data, I've kind of looked at it. Um, if you look at a map of the US where vaccination rates are high, it's in the Northeast, it's on the coasts, Florida, actually even Texas is not that bad, right? You get into the center, you get to Idaho, the Southern states, Alabama, um, Mississippi, et cetera, and rates plummet. So you gotta wonder like what, okay, what is this culturally that's going on? And why should cultural aspects affect a scientific risk decision. Now we know why, because we're human beings, right? But you really have to start asking yourself, okay, if, if, if you're gonna make a decision based on health and you're gonna do it culturally, okay, that's fine, you can do that, it's based on your values. But if you look at actual data sets, well, why is it that Idaho's not vaccinating and Alabama's not vaccinating and so on? And then you have to dig into, okay, what are the, cultural aspects of these things. And I think they're actually multifocal. They're, they're, they're multivariate. There's many aspects to it. If you look at, and I've read people writing about this, people who are actually against the vaccine, they go to New York or they go to San Francisco and there's a vibe of like, it's almost a collectivist vibe. Like, hey, just pitch in, do this thing, be done with it and it's better for everybody. And you know, we're even willing to do like vaccine passports so that you can come in because we just think you're gonna get the vaccine right now. Those are very controversial. And when I talked with Dr. Monica Gandhi about it on my show uh, the other day, she's talking about immune passports. So that means even like if you've been infected, you get a passport, right? That's what they, they do in some parts of Europe. It seems to work quite well. But the point is there's a, in the dense urban areas, there's a collectivist mindset, which is like, hey, we're not gonna get through this properly 
if we don't all pitch in because we're tight here, right? Um, and then politically, they may be a little more lefty. There's all kinds of components there. But then you go to like Idaho, Alabama, et cetera, people are spread out more. There's a mindset of individuality or individualism. There's distrust of government. So there's a political ideological focus there and so on. So what does all this have to do with science? Nothing. It's not like, so, so let's just weigh this for a second, right? Do you think that the scientific literacy in San Francisco versus Idaho, to be able to look at primary data and feel comfortable with a vaccine, do you really think it's that different Right? You could argue, well, there's more universities in San Francisco in that area, and maybe the, the general level of college education is higher and so on. So maybe there's a component of that. But more likely, it's these cultural aspects, a mix of ideology, belief, collectivism versus individualism, the uh, adaptation to the environment at hand, self-selection, people who may move to Idaho. I'm picking on Idaho because it has one of the lowest vaccination rates, um, not because I have anything you know, for or against Idaho. And, and so these th these are things that then seem to affect uptake of a vaccine that even though it helps individuals is also billed by the mainstream media as a collectivist act. So do you see how that can kind of mess with people a little bit? It's very complicated making sense, sense-making in our current climate, right? And there's so many factors that go into that decision. Uh, so. Anyways, that's, that's my thinking on that. Amy Patterson says, I got my first vaccine thanks to you. Hell yeah, I love it. I, I really, dude, I really get excited when people get vaccinated, I do. And you can look, go look on Sunshine Act. I'm not taking money from pharma. In fact, pharma doesn't like me because <laughs> I say some really heterodox stuff, but I just like people doing well. Right now I'm in the Bay Area, right? But I was in Vegas for the last eight years. Vegas is a pretty purple area, pretty libertarian. I have a lot of libertarian sentiment. I have a lot of mistrust of government. I have a lot of mistrust of industry. So I'm with the people who are vaccine hesitant on almost everything. <laughs> yeah, but when I, when I come down and look at it, you know, it's pretty clear that the way through this, as Monica Gandhi on my show said, is through immunity, whether it's from pre-existing infection or vaccine or a combination. Right, so that is the way through. Um, so the ideologic stuff, the belief stuff, the cultural stuff, it's all there. Um, you got to respect it. But honestly, now looking at it, you kind of go, okay, well, so this is more ideological than it is scientific. Let's just put that out there and say that this is how it is. It's probably how it is for a lot of things, right? Um, how soon will the FDA officially approve the second booster, third COVID vaccine? Yeah, you know this whole booster thing? Look, I don't know the answer to that. I'm gonna say this. This is, this is where distrust comes from. So two FDA officials resign. We don't really know why, but we think we know why, which is that they're upset that um, administration is pushing this booster for healthy people you know, across the board when there's not great data that that's a great idea. And you know, the rest of the world is still trying to get vaccine where the variants are developing. And it sends signals like, oh, this thing's not good enough, so everybody should get a third dose, just in case, because we, we're just worried it's, you know, gonna, antibodies are gonna wane, forgetting about, you know, T cell immunity, durable B cell memory immunity, um, protection against severe disease, which is all we really care about. Instead, we're like worried about people testing positive. It's like, who cares, right? Now, um, uh, so the booster thing, for yes, for elderly people, for people with the compromised immune systems, I think yes. And part of the reason is that the original spacing of this vaccine was, was I, I'm speculating and others have speculated, it was too close together, particularly for Pfizer, three weeks apart. Um, and in, for some individuals, that, that spacing might've been like just getting one shot, right? Too close together. So in some ways that third dose is saying, okay, well, all right, we didn't have enough time to really spread them out and see if that had an effect, but now we do. And it does seem to have, really does increase antibody levels. So let's do that. Now, the other option is to spread out the first dose. Of course, the danger with that is you have a window where you know protection against um, disease is less with just a single dose. So there, it's always this kind of give and take, that's another common question by email that I get. Should I space out my second dose? I've gotten my first dose, space out my second dose. The truth is we don't know the answer to that, right? I don't think there's a lot of harm 
in spacing it out, you know, uh, a little bit. But I think we just don't know enough to space it out a lot until we get more data, right? Now, if you've been infected before, even a single dose is probably enough, but the government's not acknowledging that just yet, right? But, you know, there you go. So that, that, that's another, um, you know, that's another uh, 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 piece of the puzzle. Now, Melissa says, um, I'm frustrated. Melissa McCrary says, I'm frustrated uh, with the misperception of people thinking that if they're vaccinated, they can hold my three uh, month old, but can't touch um, my six year old and can't touch me. Uh, so if they're vaccinated, they can hold the th three month old. Um, well, okay, let me let me parse this into a question that I get a lot by email. I'm vaccinated, my husband's vaccinated. We have a newborn baby or a young kids that can't be vaccinated. We have a lot of friends and family that are unvaccinated. We would like, we, we don't know what to do with them because they're gonna come and infect our kids potentially. And the truth is, yeah, that's right. Um, you have to decide what your risk tolerance is. Most kids do fine with coronavirus, but some don't. Some end up getting MISC, the MIS-C inflammatory syndrome of children. Some get sick. Some go on to infect a grandparent who may have even been vaccinated, but the immunity's waned. They haven't gotten a booster or they're one of those people that is one of the 10% that you know doesn't get protection against severe disease for whatever idiosyncrasy of their immune system, right? So th th these are real nuanced questions that you don't have a black and white answer for. Public health and authorities will try to make it a black and white answer, which will say, everybody should get two shots of the mRNA vaccines or one shot of Johnson & Johnson and a booster later. That's what they'll say, because that it's the simplest answer to confuse the least number of people. The problem is it's not true. It's not an honest answer. It's not a nuanced answer. And so people's BS meter goes, wait, what? I was infected. I went through hell with COVID. Why the hell would I need to get two where I'm gonna feel like crap with those two as well? Because you know that immune system gets rebooted. Um, you know, so the, the messaging becomes difficult and then nuanced situations like that where you have to rely on your own, what are your values? I am, my 10 year old is in school, she's unvaccinated. I have not lost a wink of sleep worried about her getting infected, right? She has no comorbidities. Um, all, the rest of the family, including my 13 year old are vaccinated. So there's a cocooning effect that seems to be seen in the data when a lot of the adults and family are vaccinated, kids are less likely to get sick. The reason we're seeing a lot of kids um, show up in hospitals is a mix of, well, they're the last people that are you know, sort of susceptible now because a lot of adults are vaccinated, but often in areas where there aren't a lot of adults vaccinated with Delta being so contagious, now they're getting infected, whereas before they might've been a little resistant, now they're getting infected and some of them are getting hospitalized just by statistical chance because we kind of know what it is. Again, the, the, the overall mortality in children, the death rate is quite low. That was another piece of the data puzzle that I looked at in the Stanford data. So, okay, Idaho is not vaccinating, the Deep South is not vaccinating. And then what's going on with kids? They are increasing. They're at their highest rate of uh, cases since the pandemic began, which is to be expected with Delta and the fact that they can't be vaccinated. But the death rate in children uh, doesn't look like it's, you know, dangerously high or rising a lot or anything like that, that's alarming yet. Now these things can all change. Remember that deaths and hospitalizations can lag cases, right? So we're seeing, and that brings me to this point. I did a video uh, about a month ago uh, based on an article by David uh, Wallace Wells that said, and you can find it on my website or on YouTube or Facebook or wherever, that, that basically said, listen, this, this Delta surge may crash much faster than you think because of the nature of the viral dynamics. So it tears through vulnerable people, it's very contagious, but then people change their behavior. They go get vaccinated, they wash hands, distance, whatever, they maybe cancel some things they were gonna do. Uh, people get natural immunity, vaccine immunity, and the thing peters out, and we've seen this pattern. And the prediction was, if the US were following a UK model, and the UK has more vaccination than us, um, we ought to see it start to, to, to turn around beginning of September. Well, guess what? The cases are starting to come down. Deaths are still rising because they lag, right? They, they, they can happen two weeks, three weeks, a month after cases rise. But we are seeing this happen. So this, this is a, 
reasonably predictable thing. Now it's not even throughout the country. As I also said in that video, the South, in the South, it may happen first because of this, their summer predilection to be inside. Um, in the Northeast, it may happen later. So it may be patchy. The US is not so homogenous as say Great Britain. It's very spread out geographically. So you're gonna see it come in fits and starts, but the area under the curve, the average is starting to turn around in terms of cases, right? And barring some change, which could always happen, including like something like a moo, which by the way, moo, in order to be more, uh, successful than Delta, it's got to kick so much ass. It's got to like totally juke the vaccines and it's got to be hyper transmissible. And I don't know that we necessarily see that yet, right? Now, it's going to show up, no doubt, but we're, you know, it's being watched, but it's kind of like Delta's a superstar, man. And that's in a way, as Monica said on my show, in a way that's good because, you know, it's not good for the people who are suffering and dying. It's good for the fact that it tears through and generates immunity. So, you know, all these people who are unvaccinated getting infected, some of the vaccinated people who are getting, you know, mild, moderate infection and are getting super immunity now, they're gonna be immune against a lot in the future, maybe even other uh, variants. So this is how you push this thing to turn from a pandemic into something endemic, like a common cold, four of which are caused by coronaviruses. And you can imagine historically those coronaviruses might have wreaked havoc like these do, like this one does, right? Um, and so that that's kind of the um, the shift. And uh, Darla Burton says, "Hey, kids have RSV where I work, not COVID. So RSV is booming. Why is that? Well, it's probably because the the closures of schools, the intense masking, the distancing, the travel restrictions, all that have loosened, and RSV is very sensitive to those, maybe." And now we're seeing it even off season. It's like catch up. And so all these kids that would have gotten RSV, you know, before are now catching up and getting it, you know, as, as it goes through and whether it's schools or whether it's um, households or whatever it is. And even adults get RSV and they can have these symptoms. There's been a lot of adults getting symptoms of uh, flu-like symptoms that test negative for COVID actually. Um, so we are seeing that. Now, one other interesting piece of data that I saw um, on, in this Stanford data set that was compiled from all around was vaccine hesitancy by country. And this is where it gets interesting. Again, it gets to something just, it's just fascinating to me. So guess which country is the most vaccine hesitant? Russia. Russia is the most vaccine hesitant country. Guess who's number two? US, the Russians got a speed on vaccine hesitancy, then the US, and then it's, you know, like the whole cavalcade of things, but we're one of the worst. So you kind of look at this and go, okay, well, now again, what's going on? So is it that Russians just really don't trust their government? Probably. Are they anti-scientific? I don't know. Is there some cultural thing against needles? Maybe. I have no idea. What, why the US? It's belief, it's ideology. It's not like the US are a bunch of genius scientists that are looking at the primary data and seeing flaws in it and going, you know what? I think antibody dependent enhancement's happening. No, they have an aversion to this thing, to being told what to do, to having it be politicized, to being shamed and ostracized, to the perception that it's rushed, to distrust of media, government, institutions, distrust of doctors, right? So a lot of stuff. So all you gotta do to, to support your belief is go online. You'll find some, you know, bogus scientist saying something. Well, the lipid nanoparticle uh, accumulates in the ovaries, which is another email I get a lot. And I tell people, yeah, I believe that was an animal study in mice with supraphysiologic doses of this stuff. Like they just basically creamed this mouse and they were like, look, it's in everything. It's like, uh-huh, really? Uh, and then you look at the real world and you go, oh, look at this. <laughs> What's actually happening in the world? Are people dropping dead of, you know, are, are, are we suddenly a sterile population? No, none of that. We're seeing none of that. And believe me, they're looking. People are like, oh, but the VARES database is showing this and this and this and this. Okay, yeah. Well, what is the background rate of this and this and this and this? And what's going on with VARES? So I've done, I've actually done videos on this. I won't rehash it all. Um, and there is, there are, I've seen it in the comments, you know, there are legitimate fears that 
this whole vaccination pandemic thing is a power grab by you know transhumanist Bill Gates types to control the population. And listen, between you and me, that's the most rational fear you can have because it's not talking about science. It's talking about geopolitics and humans, right? Should you trust a billionaire like Gates, no matter how much money he's put here or there, are there conspiracy theories around rich people? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, are some of these people despicable? <laughs> totally. Should we trust like what anyone in the Silicon Valley says about anything? Not without a lot of due diligence. I know these people, they think they know everything. They are the worst people. You know, like it's some, some big tech person is like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you're just like, wow, you're a condescending, dumb piece of crap who thinks they know everything. And you don't, you don't even understand people. You're so in your own head. You know, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, that kind of distrust, I man, I'm with you. I am so with you. I'm still vaccinated, right? And I'm team Moderna. I'm gonna come clean, guys. I didn't choose it, it chose me. The Moderna life, I didn't choose it, it chose me. And I like Moderna for a couple of reasons. I like that high dose. I like this extra week of spacing, um, but both vaccines are fine and J&J &J is fine too. But I like the Moderna too, because it, you know there was NIH funding that went into it. I'm just not a big fan of the big pharmaceutical companies. You know, they, I, I am a big fan of their research sides and their, the physicians who work in their stuff, but their marketing and business side and their, the pricing and everything is just, we need a better system, right? Um, but I'll tell you, you know, some, of those, some of those research people are just heroic. Um, so yeah, I'm team Moderna, I gotta say. I'm not saying go out and get Moderna at the exclusion of other things. I'm just saying, I'm team Moderna snitches. Um, have you had COVID? If so, can you talk about your experience? Um, Jessica, no, I haven't had COVID, right? Because I'm part of the zoomocracy. Huh? This is the inequity of COVID. Uh, you know, if, if, I, if I go to the hospital, I'm in head to toe PPE. If I do my show and educate and do that thing, which is the predominance of what I do, I don't have to like go out and travel and do all of that, right? I did, I did travel in, in the spring, uh, fully vaccinated, went, no masks at all. Las Vegas did a talk for a big um, surgical podiatry conference, like thousand people, hugged, shook hands, reconnected. This was in, I don't know, March, I don't, I don't remember um, exactly. But that was like the most exposure I probably could have gotten, you know? And my wife's at Stanford, but they're pretty cautious on the job exposure is really rare because everyone's masked and everything. Um, so I didn't get, no one in my family has confirmed COVID. My wife even had her antibodies checked, they were negative before vaccination, um, but we're all vaccinated. Now, so how is that fair, right? That I can pull that off, but like, you know, an essential worker can't pull that off. And, um, and uh, you know, it's this zoomocracy that's perfectly happy to have kids at home rather than in school. You know, again, it gets to this whole thing about like my deep hatred of the Silicon Valley <laughs> where I live. Like, you know, these people are perfectly happy to put their kids in private school where they can be open and then publicly say that school should be closed, you know? It's just, it's not, it's not right. Um, it's not right. And then you wonder why, you know, people don't trust any of this. Um, people wanting them alt middle sweatshirts. Are you gonna sell them in your store? Yeah, we have the supporter tribe, number four, life, L-Y-F-E dot com. Whatever we have is there and we do them in little batches. Like we'll make a new set of shirts and Risa will build them and we'll send them out. And you know, those aren't really to make us money. Those are to kind of get a movement happening, right? So people see the shirt on the street, they ask you questions. Like we had a 5G vaccinated shirt that was like viral. And it, people would ask, "Why are you against vaccines? Are you for vaccines?" And you know, if you're wearing the shirt, you're pretty much for vaccines. But it's hard to tell from the shirt. So then you have to have a conversation with somebody. Which, again, it takes it off the internet, puts it in real life. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so this this general resistance in America is interesting. That we're, you know we have that in common with the Russians, right? So 
I don't know. I, I, I really, really, really hope you guys, if you haven't been exposed, that you do get vaccinated. I really do. Like that's the punchline of a lot of my emails. Some of my emails, when I respond, I say, you know what, I, I you know, whatever you choose is gonna be right because you're low, you're really low risk, but I still would love it to see you get vaccinated just because it's gonna improve the overall immunity. And we don't know what variants coming down the road that you might be protected from severe disease, but not infection. So it's worth, you know, it's worth uh, getting that vaccine. Um, please, please, please do a response video to Tom McDonald's song. I don't know what that is, uh, but it sounds interesting. Um, a movement number one or number two, both, Melissa. Uh, essential worker going for my first test tomorrow, dread the brain jabber. Essential worker, my first test. Oh, they're, yeah. Are they still testing you? Are you vaccinated? So a lot of healthcare workers are not vaccinated. Not so much doctors, but everybody else. Nurses in particular are not vaccinated. Um, I've talked about this quite a bit. I, again, I would really just love to see higher vaccination rates. Like what, we, what what's happening in Europe, higher vaccination rates, they're opening up, right? Even post-Delta, Delta crash pretty quick because there's enough immunity overall. Hospitals don't get fully overwhelmed. They get busy. Listen, hospitals are gonna get busy. That's the nature of this, right? And it sucks. It sucks because healthcare workers are, are really done. They're cooked. It's been terrible, right? Um, but it's gonna end. And you know there'll probably be another wave of something. Best thing you can do is be immune. Either because you've been infected before, don't go out and get infected or just get vaccinated. It's really, you know, it's not, it's really not that complicated. We make it more complicated than it is. Um, let me see, let me scroll back through. These comments move so fast. You guys got so many comments. Um, what else What? What else do I see in the, in the emails? You know, it's a lot of like misinformation debunking. Hey, can you debunk this video? Can you debunk that video? Can you, and basically I, I, I like to give people principles so they can debunk their own videos. Like, there's some principles, right? If you look at a video and you go, well, okay, they have not given the other side of this argument any due course. They're just saying this and they don't say the other side. So it's not a real scientific conversation or discourse. It's like, I have an agenda and this is what it is, right? Often there's a fake expert, meaning they may have credentials, but they're a, a super outlier in their field. <clears throat> and they're also not necessarily qualified to make these broad sweeping statements, right? Um, about human vaccines, right? Uh, often there, there's no, there's nothing you can do to disprove them because when stuff comes out, like you know, somebody says, "Oh, the vaccines are going to sterilize everybody," and nobody's sterilized, then they go, "What's going to happen in five years?" Just wait, based on this, you know, lemur study in Sri Lanka. That's a preprint, and you're like, um. Do monoclonal antibodies replace your natural antibodies? They're temporary, right? So they augment your natural antibodies. They may reduce the amount of natural antibodies you make, but that's just speculation because by binding antigen, but I don't, I'd have to see the data on that. And I may be completely wrong even speculating that, right? So we'd have to talk to a good immunologist to be able to say, okay, no, this is what we actually see with monoclonals. But one of the reasons they say don't get vaccinated, you know, within a three months or so after monoclonals is that uh, the, the monoclonals may still be circulating. They may bind uh, uh, to antigen that you give in the form of vaccine. And then you're not gonna actually get a good immune response from your own body. So they kind of act as like, you know, little wingmen that turn into little C blockers. You know what I mean? Uh, but again, this is, I'm pulling this out of my ass. So please forgive me for making stuff up um, on that. Yeah, that lemur study in Sri Lanka, Linda, I know. Um, what percentage of hospitalized unvaccinated are also obese and other comorbidities? <clears throat> That's an excellent question. I haven't looked at this primary data, but my suspicion from previous data is that there's always, there's not always, there's often something going on, whether it's obesity, whether it's hypertension, whether it's um, undiagnosed prediabetes, some metabolic syndrome that is often associated with bad outcomes. Not always, some perfectly healthy people get sick, but it's really more a disease. And that's something we hardly ever talk about. We are a fat, sick population of Americans. And <clears throat> 
we that was another piece of data in the Stanford set. We have one of the highest per capita death rates from Delta um, compared to the rest of the world. Now, why would that be? Per capita death rates. All right. Well, one reason is we're lower in vaccination rate than the rest of the developed world. With the exception of, say, something like, 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 like Israel, which has a high vaccination rate, also has a high per capita death rate. And this has been speculated on quite a bit. One of it is that, well, <laughs> Israel only used Pfizer three weeks apart, right? And, you know, it's a pretty compact population mixed with some unvaxxed people. There's some inequity in vaccine, but then also vaccinated early, maybe some waning immunity, so on and so forth, right? But it's not fully clear. But then again, you just have, you really have to tease out what's going on. But still, their per capita death rate is a lot less than ours. So ours is really high. Why? Well, partially because we're unvaccinated. So remember, the vaccine prevents severe disease and death much better than it prevents infection. So per capita, we die more because we're less vaccinated because belief. It's not access. In some cases, it is. It's belief. And remember, when you have a, like a minority group like African Americans or Latinos, Latinas, I refuse to say Latinx, that's just stupid. <laughs> Latinos are Latinas um, that are resistant for historical reasons. So maybe African Americans just don't trust this system, right? And there's multiple, and again, I don't even profess to be able to put myself in that situation or that that history because it's in many ways unimaginable. You have to have been through it. You have to be the person who gets stopped by the cops all the time and you know remembers Tuskegee and all of this, right? That's it's hard to imagine. But we should try. We should try to go, well, okay, what what, what is that? And then you have an some immigrant populations that are afraid of being documented, right, by getting vaccines. So there's some nuance in all the, the belief structure. Um, but the per capita death rate in the United States is higher, partially because again, our vaccination rate is lower. If our vaccination rate was higher, like Great Britain, per capita deaths, not so bad. Opening up, doing all that. This is our way out. Immunity is our way out, right? You know, why do we bother bending the curve and doing all that? To get to a vaccine or to some semblance of herd immunity. Well, we thought we were, even in the spring, I was like, man, herd immunity is like here, this is it. Delta changes the herd immunity calculations because it's so contagious, easily spread, high viral loads. Herd immunity threshold goes up from 70% to 90%. Much harder to prevent widespread replication. And that's just a bummer, but, it, but it's just how these viruses work, right? Um, looking at some comments. How would you approach talking to a pediatrician about a single dose of vaccine versus two? My 14 year old has previous case asymptomatic and I have concerns about two doses. This is another email I get all the time. Okay, the first thing I have to do is be very careful here. I'm not a pediatrician. If I start trying to replace your pediatrician, I'm committing malpractice, right? That's another thing I tell people in emails. I'm, this is not individual medical advice. I'm not your doctor. I'm a clown on the internet who happens to have a lot of training was you know, deputy chief of medicine at Stanford, was at Stanford for 10 years. You see what I'm doing here? I'm subtly appealing to authority, trying to incept you into trusting me. Hospital medicine for 10 years, molecular biology major out of Berkeley, UCSF medicine, Stanford uh, residency, a lot of experience, but I'm not a pediatrician. So pediatricians will often gently chide me and say, hey, please uh, be careful what you're telling parents about their kids. But I can say this, <clears throat> it's always a risk benefit calculation. And I've had pediatrician Paul Offit on the show to talk about this. In his estimation, your risk of myocarditis in kids is roughly one in 30, one in, between one in 20,000 and one in 40,000, mostly young boys, and worse after second dose. Natural COVID's risk of myocarditis is like tenfold higher than that. It's, it's really much higher. So in his estimation, it's much better risk calculation to give the vaccine. Now, your question is very specific. The kid was infected. Can't they just get away with one dose? Why do they need to have two? You know? And the answer is, hmm, that's a really good question, right? 
and it's worth bringing up with the pediatrician, but the, sometimes the pediatrician's hands are tied because there are official recommendations. And if the pediatrician deviates, then they are taking a little bit of a medical legal sort of stance. They're saying, okay, yeah, I know CDC says this, but for your kid, we should do this. And that's what we do in medicine, but you can understand like it's much easier and more straightforward for a pediatrician just to, to really say, listen, these things are low risk. The chance of your kid having this happen is quite low. Just get both doses. So that's the kind of give and take with how we think about kids. Now, there are people who take a more firm stand, but they're not pediatricians, right? So Dr. Vinay Prasad, Dr. Marty McCary have really questioned like, should we be using all this vaccine on kids when they're generally low risk, when we should really just vaccinate all the adults and create a cocoon effect, right? I'm partially sympathetic to that. And I'm partially like, as a parent, I'm just like, yeah, but my 13 year old got vaccinated. I feel better, right? My 10 year old, I don't know. It, I just look at the statistics and go, it's just not that high risk in a very highly vaccinated community like the Bay Area. That was the other data from the Stanford data set that I saw this morning. The Bay Area are superstars of vaccination, right? Again, cultural stuff. It's a little more like collectivist identity here, dense urban area, um, left-leaning, all of that. Ideologically, go get vaccinated, right? So it is interesting. Although classically, you get the kind of new agey kind of lefty stuff where people don't trust medicine, right? They want alternative stuff, natural measles parties and chicken pox parties and that kind of thing for kids vaccination. So it's more nuanced than all that. Um, Collins says, this is also confusing. I feel like so many side effects, which vaccine should one get? Look, man, it, they're look, the side effects, most, most of these side effects are like, I had them, right? I had a fever to 101.5. I had muscle aches, fatigue, shaking chills, night sweats, insomnia. I had a splitting headache, felt like I'd been hit by a train. This was my second Moderna. The first Moderna, I just had a little trouble sleeping. And I think that was my immune system just kind of being funky. Second time though, it was like doof, the whole nine, like you had a flu, minus the cough and the congestion and all of that, because that's a viral effect and there's no virus. Um, 30 hours in, I took a Tylenol, I was better, that was it. So that's the majority of stuff. Now, I do get these interesting emails from people who have said, look, I, and it's, it's really interesting. A lot of times the email has this component of, I'm, I was really against this vaccine. I'm worried about side effects. I, I, I don't trust government, but I watched your show and I went and got the vaccine against like the advice of like close family and things like that. And then, like that day I started having on the same side of my body, full on tingling, both leg and arm. I had, you know, dizziness and lightheadedness and a lot of different things. And, um, and I kind of, it's interesting because there, it, there are these syndromes called functional neurologic disorders. Functional meaning there's not a, we don't see a physical abnormality here. There's something in the pattern of our mind-body continuum, right? Our nervous system that gets tweaked and it's often got a component of unconscious expectation or fear associated with it. Not always, but it can. And so, you know, it's the kind of thing that in the old days they would have said, oh, it's all in your head, right? And so, well, everything is in your head. <laughs> everything is. So that's dumb. It's a real thing, real symptoms. And I kind of follow these folks out, you know, they email me and I kind of follow up and to a one they get better, especially when you kind of send them an article on functional neuro neurologic disorder. You say, you know what, go see your doctor. But like, there's this interesting thing that can happen, especially when we, we especially unconsciously are very worried. And I, I tell the story when I got my first um, Moderna, it was very early, like in January-ish. Um, you know, when I got the shot, you know, the big concern then the big collective unconscious concern was anaphylaxis, right? Everybody was worried, like, am I gonna get a big allergic reaction? Because that was something that we were seeing early on. And um, so I sat there for the 15 minutes and I, I was just like, man, I'm a little nervous, right? You know, and I, I live videoed it and my, you know, I had my kids with me because I'd taken them from camp or whatever. And, um, 
And as I was walking to my car, I was just like, man, I just don't feel great. Like I'm a little panicky and a little bit like, hmm. And so, you know, I just sat in the, in the car for like 10 minutes and was like, hey girls, let's listen to some music. And I was just listening to some music. And I'm like, man, I hope I'm not having anaphylaxis. It was entirely psychogenic, entirely here because expectations, even unconscious expectations have a huge physical effect, right? Well, in the end I felt a million times, I was fine, right? No problem at all, went home, no problem at all. Second shot, not a problem at all. Had real physical effects that you could measure with um, 101.5 and shaking chills and headache and all that. So these are, no one is, th this is not like some sign of weakness or weirdness or craziness. It's a sign of being human. It's a sign that we are, we're not a mind and a body. It's a body mind, it's one, it's one thing. Right, and we ought to use that for healing, right? It's medicine ought to be more shamanic, right? But what the hell do I know? I've done videos on this. Um, I felt that way, such a mind melt, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, Stephanie uh, Gillian, Gillen, that, that's how it is, it's really crazy. It, it's a thing called the nocebo effect. It's like, you know, the placebo effect, you get all these good effects from a, from a, you know, from a, a medicine, even if it's a sugar pill. You can have the opposite. And I think we're seeing that a lot, especially in VARES when people are reporting because all your eyeballs are on, on this vaccine. Anything happens, people are gonna report it. Whether it's nocebo effect, whether, you know, whatever it is. And then it's on the authorities to actually investigate that, right? Because it's there. And, and believe me, everybody's skin in the game. Like these are people who are taking the vaccine themselves, right? unless you're a conspiracy theorist and you think they're not, but they are. All right, I think it's time to go. Um, I think, um, I mean, there's so many good questions. We'll have to catch them another time. Um, that's really it. I think we kind of covered a lot of stuff today. So hopefully this was helpful. Um, I, 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 immunity is the way through this, it really is. So if you've been infected, if you've been vaccinated, if you're unvaccinated and uninfected, please go get vaccinated. That, that, that's, that's the message, really. That's what I wanna convey. And hopefully there's been some nuance in this. Um, really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Maria, for the stars and for talking about Rachel Hoffness. She is a rock star. Um, that's a great video if you haven't seen that. Rachel uh, Zoffness, I should say, talking about chronic pain and biopsychosocial components of pain. Very, very powerful video about the mind-body continuum. It's all on my website, zdogmd.com. If you wanna join our supporter tribe where we kind of do live videos, it's interactive, you and me hanging out, um, zdogmd.com forward slash supporters. And then you can always support our show with a one-time donation on PayPal, paypal.me, M-E, forward slash zdogmd. And um, I respond to every donation with a personal email reply. It may take a few days, but I respond to every one of those PayPal single time donations because you're not joining the tribe. You're not getting access to live videos and all that, but you can get at least a thank you appreciation for me because I do appreciate your support. You make all this possible, right? All right, guys, I love you so much. I really do. Until next time, we are out. Peace. <laughs>